When talking about biology, we often talk about water as a universal solvent, the hydrogen-bonded backdrop against which the more vital reactions of life play out. Without water, life on Earth couldn't have blossomed, and billions of years later, none can live without it. But it still seems to take a backseat to other, more exciting molecules. Proteins, lipids, DNA. But you humans are 65% water by weight, 98% by molecular count. So is it really reasonable to presume that this little molecule plays such a milk toast role inside of your cells? One can make a case for a much more active role for water in biology, but not in the form of a disordered liquid, as an emergent structure that's a consequence of nearby surfaces. As we'll see in this video, this sort of ordered water plays two roles in biology. On one hand, it allows organisms to perform astounding feats of strength, and on the other, it stabilizes the chaotic, crowded world of the cell. This exploration will take us down, down, down to the molecular limit of what humans and their machines can't even see, and will demonstrate how, under the right conditions, small shifts in chemistry and pressure can lead to sweeping changes, and how the same principles that govern the behavior of water play out across the whole of civilization. Chapter 1. Ordered Water. Blood, tears, saliva, urine, bile, lymph, these all flow like rivers through the body and generally lead people to think of biological water as existing in a predominantly liquid form. The standard drawing of a cell in every entry-level biology textbook, where a blobby membrane surrounds a soup of bobbing organelles, further perpetuates the idea that cells, like veins, must be full of liquid. However, various experimental findings tell a more complicated story. As far back as the 1970s, researchers doing electrophysiology recordings found that piercing a cell's membrane with an electrode didn't cause its insides to come pouring out. Neither did removing whole chunks of its membrane, nor did cutting the cells in half. In fact, as long as you left the nucleus and the centrioles alone, a sliced up cell could produce two perfectly normal daughter cells. That's sort of like saying if you cut a human in half in just the right way, it can still reproduce, which is True, but counterintuitive. Such a finding certainly suggests that humans aren't just big, ape-shaped bags of water, and it seems to say that cells aren't either. So where's all the water if it isn't just floating around and hydrating? Visualizing this is difficult, since a water molecule is about a thousand times smaller than the wavelength of visible light. Which is why it helps to turn to the work of people like David Goodsell, artist and professor at Scripps Institute. His paintings of intracellular landscapes show a crowded profusion of proteins and membranes, with only enough space for a finite number of water molecules in the gaps. With so few waters and the presence of so many surfaces, there can be no such thing as flow, since that depends on an abundance of slippery and transient water-to-water -water hydrogen bonds. Instead, the aquatic landscape of the cell is dominated by much stickier interactions between H2O molecules and membranes, proteins, even DNA itself. But not directly. This is the sort of magical thing about ordered water. The surface in question only interacts directly with the first hydration layer, which forms an orderly cloak on the surface. And this forces the next layer of water to organize, which then forces the next layer to organize, and then the next layer, and so on. And before you know it, all the available waters are organized in a radial pattern around the surfaces in the cell. This is probably why cutting a cell doesn't cause its contents to leak out. The water at the surfaces holds sway so strongly that opening up the cell doesn't really have much of an effect. The emergent force of all of this interfacial water allows it to actually bear colossal loads and to stabilize the behavior of the cell, but also at just the right moment to let everything loose. The implications of this peculiar paradigm are twofold. The first is that water's role in the cell might be as much about structural reinforcement as it is about dissolution. But it also means that as the water changes, so does everything else. And just as individual waters are organized by surfaces and transient, load-bearing structures, so humans are structured by social interfaces like markets, ideologies, institutions, substances, and generation. Chapter 2. The Shape of Water now that we've explained how living creatures are full of this highly organized interfacial water, and before we make clearer the connections between physical nature and social tendencies, 
it would behoove us to understand what all this order actually does. And for that, we turn to seats, where the ability of ordered water to do work plays a central reproductive role. Consider the dandelion aching. Each seed is attached to a thin vertical beak, which terminates in a feathery pappus. The joint between these two structures, the pulvinus, contains a small amount of water-responsive material that uses structured water to open and close the pappus in response to changes in environmental humidity. On a hot, dry day, the pulvinus shrinks, which allows the feathers of the pappus to unfurl and catch the wind. Landing the seeds runs in reverse. An increase in humidity, which suggests a fruitful place to grow, causes water to rush into the pulvinus. As it swells, it furls the parasol's top, and the akeen quickly runs aground. Pine trees, whose seeds are nearly 14,000 times heavier than those of the dandelion, also use water for seed dispersal. But their strategy is a little different. Here, hygroscopic elements are in the cones, not in the seeds themselves. When it rains, the scales absorb water and swell closed. When the weather clears, the innovation becomes apparent. Each scale contains two layers, and the arrangement of the water in the top layer causes it to shorten as it dries, while the bottom one remains long. This opens up the cone and allows the wind to disperse the seed inside. But not all work is done by water for the sake of being caught in the wind. In geranium plants, seed dispersal is driven directly by an evaporation-powered spring. Each seed matures at the end of a slender rostrum, which evaporation slowly twists into a tighter and tighter coil. At some critical point, the rostrum snaps and the recoil propels the seed away. When it lands, the remnant of the coil still responds to water, and as the humidity changes, it slowly rotates back and forth to drive the seed deeper and deeper into the earth. In all these examples, the movement of tightly organized water through specialized structures causes large mechanical movements that accomplish some function. But returning to the scale of the cell, we find that the shape taken by water can go even further. In some cases, it holds the line between awakening and slumber. Like in those microbes that can sense when they're about to run out of resources, and as a consequence of a bunch of genetic programs that cause asymmetric reproduction, turn themselves into a spore, which is ready for indefinite hibernation. No one quite knows how long a spore can stay asleep. A few brave researchers have suggested 250 million years, others 25 million, and there's the conservative estimate of 70 years. It's been shown that they can survive the hard vacuum of space for at least six years, and convincing proposals about the nature of spores structured water have suggested that number could be much larger. These little creatures are held in astonishingly stable, yet reversible stasis because the water inside their cores has become so ordered that it's like time and motion have completely stopped. The water in their outer shells is even more interesting because it has to have a dynamic structure, one that constantly changes in response to the environment without accidentally reawakening the spores when conditions aren't ideal. During hibernation, the water molecules cling so tightly to the proteins of the outer shell that it's as if they're frozen at room temperature. But if a molecule that outcompetes the interaction between the shell and water comes along, the stable structure is broken and the spore hatches into a new bacterium. Like all the previous examples, the spore illustrates the vital role of structured water in nature and points out how this incredibly abundant molecule, so often considered to be formless and passive, can perform great feats of strength when it's ordered at a surface. Having laid out the evidence for the astounding abilities of interfacial water, we can now move on to the titular question. How is it that humans are like water. Chapter three, civilization as the human interface. Okay, this is the nerd philosophy poetry portion of the program where we put all this together into a version of the world that tries to integrate physics, biology, and human behavior. We're happy to field all the questions, comments, and irate complaints wherever you can find us. Seat backs and tray tables in the upright and locked position, folks. To really explain the parallel between humans and waters, we have to imagine a model where the individual is analogous to a single molecule of H2O and social interfaces, things like markets, religions, institutions, substances, and reproduction, order and instruct human behavior the way that surfaces inside the cell order and instruct the behavior of water. Parallels between the two systems are most obvious inside of hydrated cells, where water can be found in two states, a disordered bulk state and a highly structured hexagonal configuration at the surface of hydrophilic proteins and lipid membranes. This coordinated form of water that forms at boundaries stabilizes everything it touches, but it is by no means permanent. A periodic return to bulk conditions accomplishes physical transitions like shape change, chemical reactions, or motion. When people speak of the system, they're talking about the metaphorical surfaces of society. 
markets, ideologies, institutions, even family and consumption, that are the foundational interfaces for human behavior. When they speak of the system being broken, they usually mean that a destructive resonance has arisen at these social surfaces, where the humans associated with them have become ordered in a way that perpetuates destruction. Periodically, these social structures collapse and humans revert temporarily to a bulk phase, which is an interregnum between the dominance of an old behavioral structure and the rise of a new one. It is the chaotic window of paradigm shifts in trade, governance, knowledge, eros, and appetites. Consider the metaphorical surface of the market, which shapes trade. When the market is in a confirmation that prizes efficiency and profits, this predominantly orders trade into the form of large corporations. It also produces conditions where there are few, if any, alternatives available, since the corporate structure rewards and reinforces a market that prizes efficiency above all else. In theory, the highly structured confirmation of trade could shift into a more relaxed state if markets prioritize different parameters, or if a less centralized form of business could be demonstrated as equally efficient. Another example is ideology, which is the social interface that structures tribalism and governance. In the highly ordered condition, human rule tends toward authoritarianism, which history has shown coordinates human behavior to atrocious ends. Those who are directly involved in the centralized dispersion of dogma would be most similar to the crystalline layer of water directly at the surface. And those whose lives are irreparably altered by the iron fist of a unified creed are other layers that fall into place. When authority structures dissipate, there may be a momentary chaos, often called revolution, before governance settles into a new structure. The same parallel could be drawn for consumption, the surface that organizes the human appetite. In the highly organized condition, the goods being consumed to sate hunger have the paradoxical effect of simultaneously creating more hunger. This establishes a condition where consumed goods and experiences, alcohol, opiates, shopping, nicotine, sugar, or even television bias hunger towards addiction, where no amount of ingestion is capable of quenching the urge in question. Here, the return to the bulk state requires rediscovering satiety, both on an individual and a social level. The list goes on and on. Reproduction structures romance, churches structure knowledge, the academy structures epistemology, language structures thought, the internet structures communication, and on and on. The point is that humans are like water. And just as the incredibly stable structured waters that keep a spore asleep may be destabilized by the presence of a detergent, the organization of human civilization is dependent on stable conditions. Although the current interfaces that give structure to society appear stable on the order of years and lifetimes, an unexpected state change could suddenly remove these strictures. Universal basic income could challenge the nature of trade, just like birth control changed the paradigm of reproduction, the farm-to-table movement got people eating organic food, and the universities set humans on a quest for knowledge. So, if you ever despair in thinking that these human institutions that seem to squeeze you from all sides have become far too powerful, simply remember that it is possible for small changes to sum and create massive shifts. Make sure to check out our conversation with University of Washington professor Dr. Jerry Pollack all about the structured water and weathering paper cuts at the thinned edge of scientific inquiry. Come back next time for an exploration for what it means to flourish in the post-growth era. Subscribe for weekly movies and conversations and join our mailing list so we can stay in touch and build a better forum for discussing these questions that keep us up at night. For now, hit us up on Facebook or Twitter. See you next week, humans. Bye. Bye. You know, most people think, well, gee, water is such a simple molecule and it's all over and scientists have been studying it for years and years. Everything about water that could be known must already be known. But in fact, water does so much. It, it participates uh, in virtually everything that goes on in every one of your cells. If you line up all the molecules in the cell and just start counting, you know, one, two, three, more than 99 out of 100 would be water molecules. The reason being that they're so small and to make up that two thirds volume, you need a lot of water molecules. So. You know, to state, as in biology is often stated, that the water molecules merely are background carriers. They don't do anything, they just sit there. It's a kind of, you know, intellectual arrogance. There's no junk in the body. Everything is there for a purpose. <laughs>